the college was in ferment, the young people running around, banners and posters and all sorts of things were going on up on the walls and uh, uh, a hall was being readied and uh, he just mentioned that look there's a lot uh, going on right now because we're having a mock UN assembly. So this was the first time I'd heard of it. These uh, students, uh, each of them then gets to represent one country and then they take up uh, resolutions that have been passed and then they discuss them and uh, they each takes one side and each takes another side and then and so on and so forth. Joining the dots, I saw that in fact what was happening was uh, part of a very concerted, certainly a very concerted push to advance the UN mode of thinking about the way societies should be governed everywhere it could reach provided there was literacy enough to grasp the simplest ideas in which it was couched. And this I thought uh, was very dangerous. Welcome to you all to um, what I called a multilateral short course is a learning program on culture and development. So in that sense, I see what we'll do today and for the next couple of days as a part of that. I really don't know at this stage how that will uh, proceed. Our country has, has wandered off into places where I think it never should have gone. Partly because we haven't paid attention to this aspect which I am calling culture and development. And what has made that happen are these forces uh, that we have been chatting about since yesterday, since we arrived here. These forces and influences and uh, my perspective on what we call the multilateral system is in fact the genesis and the source of these forces and influences. The subject is not experimental in any way, the subject is extremely serious. In uh, today's session, I wanted to do the following, uh, begin with uh, what is it that we call the multilateral system and uh, how is it ordinarily visible. Just a bit about myself, I am neither an academic nor a scientist, uh, nor in fact a cultural professional. Uh, in fact, um, this was, it came as a surprise to me about the UNESCO affiliation which I have had now for a number of years uh, because I am not an anthropologist or an ethnologist or a musicologist or uh, um, a cultural administrator of any kind. Uh, what uh, I have done, however, is uh, quite a bit of documentation on uh, what these days it's fashionable to call indigenous cultures, uh, but uh, essentially means, uh, uh, you know, tribal folk as people from my generation would know or Vanvasis, uh, simply because um, I grew up in Bombay and I was always attracted partly because of uh, the closeness to the Ghats where uh, thanks to a grandfather's house, uh, we would often be packed off as children. Uh, but then later, especially to the north of Bombay, um, where the tribal societies were still flourishing, the affiliation with UNESCO. Uh, along the way, I was able to also work with the central government, which is Ministry of Agriculture and Ministry of uh, Environment. Uh, at some time, it was it, it overlapped as well. Uh, and uh, through both, uh, I was able to, in fact, um, understand better this this whole uh, juggernaut called development, uh, the cultural underpinnings of what I had seen which had no place in the uh, root or path of this juggernaut and then naturally came to think of who or what was it that was were in fact moving these great vehicles. Uh, around into our daily lives and into our uh, perceptions of uh, what our daily lives should be. Uh, as you can imagine, the U UN system is uh, is uh, the biggest, the biggest vehicle. It is, of course, the most powerful. Uh, 
uh, by most powerful, it, um, what I mean is it is completely takes over and has taken over the ways in which we begin to accept what uh, supranational authority is. This is certainly a view of the world uh, centering around the idea of multilateralism through one person's experience only. It is not a academic uh, exposition. It is not a theoretical framework. It is a long explanation. And I felt uh, around two to three years ago, in fact, even before this whole COVID tamasha, uh, I felt that uh, it was, I was approaching the time in my life when I would have to do that. Because um, I spent this time with UNESCO, earlier I was with uh, these ministries and so on. So one has uh, been able to see what the world has been presented as. And having been presented with this, what one is expected to do, provided one subscribes to all this. So, uh, I think for anybody with, uh, you know, a modicum of conscience, you would say, all right, I can do this much to, to earn my living, to get an income, to maintain myself, my family and so on. But beyond what point will I not do it? And I think that is, uh, that is some point, uh, that is something which we must not face, uh, not come to face and then shrink away because, uh, the comforts of, you know, the comforts that you have become accustomed to then become comforts that you don't want to leave. But then because, you know, as our samskaras tell us, there is a point at which we have to start moving away from all this. I decided that let me try and look for organizations which uh, are willing to listen to and have the truths aired in ways that at least help younger people uh, who are, would be caught in the same mesh. Um, be better prepared when that time comes for them. Uh, and this I thought was also lacking in our societies. And I don't mean only Indian societies because fortunately through this uh, UNESCO, fortunately for me, through this UNESCO experience, I've seen a number of Asian societies, Southeast Asia, East Asia, Central Asia and so on. And I think it is lacking in all of them. Where the, where what we call the multilateral system is concerned, uh, my experience does have a lot, in fact, mainly to do with uh, my years at UNESCO, which continue, uh, though in what form I cannot say now, uh, with FAO. Uh, during the five years that I spent with the Ministry of, Env of, of Agriculture uh, program, which was administered by the ICAR, FAO loomed very large indeed. And uh, FAO is one of the biggest and uh, most well-funded of the uh, UN agencies. Uh, to some extent, the WHO, I, I did in fact, uh, during I think 2007 and 8, I used I wrote uh, for the WHO bulletin, which was uh, a blot on my career, I have to say, I could freely admit, uh, uh, deluded in, in, to, to a degree still, even at that time, that uh, this was the agency that uh, had the best thinking available planet-wide on the subject of public health. Of course, it didn't, but I didn't know it then. Um, and uh, UNDP, uh, which for a number of years uh, was, the, was uh, the conceptual big daddy of them all, because uh, they had their, their fingers everywhere. They had their fingers in agriculture, in environment, in conservation, in uh, the subject that I had uh, to do with uh, the Ministry of uh, Environment for, which was environmental education, with uh, water and sanitation, with rural development. Uh, so they were everywhere. And they were also the, uh, in many cases, in many countries, uh, as I saw these countries in Asia, their people were the authors or the principal authors of, of uh, a set of UN documents which are still largely invisible to most people who know anything about the UN system. And this is called UNDAF, UNDAF, 
United Nations Development Assistance Framework. And these, uh, in fact, were very often authored by UNDP people. A little bit earlier, during the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, I also became involved with uh, critiques of what was then, at the time, I, I'm sure some of you would remember this, there was a program called the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. And uh, being at the time quite heavily immersed in public health, public health matters, um, just to, to give you a, a, a brief uh, cameo of uh, why that came about is because uh, I spent uh, quite a number of years, uh, uh, about 16 years as a full-time journalist. Uh, this was mainly in Bombay. And during 1991 and 1992, uh, when what were called uh, AIDS and what was called HIV uh, became, a very pop became very popular subjects. Uh, they were also considered to be very popular um, scientific, I think, uh, uh, avenues. Um, and uh, I was working with a weekly newspaper at that time and uh, there were not, a f not many reporters or writers uh, in the press who were willing to do it because of the great fear that surrounded the great fear that surrounded these, uh, uh, the alleged virus and the alleged epidemic. Uh, and I use the word alleged in a very, very deliberate way uh, because uh, of the great fear psychosis, which in our own lifetime we saw repeated again, we saw it reprised just two years ago. Uh, and at that time, if you went to, which a few of us did, if you went to interview what were called commercial sex workers, you were in a state of uh, what I would call fearful fascination because you wanted to know about the subject, but you had no idea about whether these airborne things are going to attack you in some way or the other. Uh, but anyway, so because of that, uh, I began, began to take an interest in this subject called public health and therefore understood, came to understand by the early 90s the role of WHO, came also to see the kind of persecution that was prevalent and is, has become even more so in the scientific community, uh, which would happen to AIDS and HIV researchers who deviated from the set line. Uh, we didn't know at that time, I was uh, still quite young, we didn't know at that time there was such a thing as a set line, nor did we know that there were deviations from it which were not permitted. Uh, so the, this was the, I think, the, the kind of overall context that uh, in bits and pieces propelled me into these directions which um, had to do with very large subjects of our era, environment, health, uh, nature and the planet and so on and with very large forces of our era, which continue to be very large forces, which uh, have shaped these, which have influenced these, uh, which have governed action, which have governed thinking, and which have set down principles uh, on the basis of which we as individuals and also the our collections, whether as individual societies or as countries, are expected to adhere to during the last five to six years, when uh, I think uh, at uh, when I passed a certain maturity with my association with UNESCO, I was able to do this. Uh, I began to um, formulate these questions in my mind. Who are these people? What are they doing? Uh, and why are we allowing it to be done to us? If it is being done to us, through what means is it being done to us? And why is it that we cannot see these means? So uh, these, I think, were the substantial questions that began naturally to raise themselves in my mind as I, as I looked at the very work that I was doing for one of these agencies and also simultaneously for a few others. But at that time, it was the main one, which was five to six years ago, which was UNESCO. 
especially from about four years ago, led me to cast around amongst uh, a circle of acquaintances uh, to ask them, um, look, you've worked in UNDP, what do you think of it? You've done something for WHO, what do you think of it? You've retired from FAO, uh, what did you do there that really made a difference to you? Uh, several from UNESCO, of course, a couple from UNICEF, which is another big, uh, very large uh, agency, very influential, very powerful. Uh, a couple from UNICEF uh, and perhaps no more than two, because I didn't know any others, uh, from a few of the UN, uh, I would say the, how to put it, uh, these are internal, internal cells or internal units which run what are called oversight services for UN agencies. And they are the ones who, <laughs> who are supposed to be the moral conscience of the world's moral conscience keeper. Uh, and I had to take part in several of their uh, surveys uh, concerning these agencies. Um, and my naivet continued, I would say, even until 2017 or 18, when I imagined that, yes, whatever is being gathered by these uh, will lead to some sort of, uh, uh, yes, you know, like some sort of correction, some sort of, look, what are we doing that isn't uh, kosher? Of course, that never happened. It wasn't intended to. So thereafter, I began to think that, look, uh, I mean, India has has never been in short supply of people uh, to send to these agencies and to send to the multilateral system. In fact, every year I think the number increases, uh, especially now from your generation. But this to me was a red signal, uh, a big red signal, because uh, the way I looked at it was that if we had to contribute people to this, then they had to be people with substance, people who had enough experience, people who had uh, considerable knowledge, people who had the wit and the ability to see what they faced in their home country, which is India, also being faced by other people in other countries whose languages they could not speak, but they could observe and identify and understand, yes, this fellow is going through the same thing or this household is going through the same thing. And therefore, if I've done something or if I've caused something to be done in my country, which has worked. Let me try and advance this over here. And I think some of that certainly did happen at that time because these were people, as I said, who were about 50 years and above, who would have had a career and some exposure in public administration uh, for 20, 25, sometimes even 30 years prior, before they went on to the, uh, the uh, international stage. Uh, and then from around the time when uh, you know, particularly, I think, uh, looking at the period of about 2005 to about 2015, when in the multilateral lending banks, the MLDBs, we saw more and more Asians, Indians uh, moving in, who were young, uh, who would have a string of freshly acquired degrees and diplomas and certifications, all gained from either American or European universities and schools into the ranks of, uh, into the lower ranks of these uh, uh, MLDB, these, these uh, multilateral development banks. And then within a matter of two to three years, they would be in positions where they were assisting the drafting of the banks Lend, country lending strategies. I think that that whole pro, uh, process to me was a very big red signal. Look what on earth is going on here. The very many groups who have been critical of what is called global finance and the global financialization of so many things that are, are now financialized, not just commodities, whether they have paid enough attention to this or whether they were persuaded not to. Indeed, I used to know some of them like Eurodad, uh, the European uh, Foundation on Debt and Development, um, 
what was the name? He was a, he was a Parsi, Parsi mystery. Uh, they were very competent with com- with uh, with theories, with frameworks, and with uh, lending strategies, effectiveness, reporting, and so on and so forth. Yes, but what about those who were in fact sitting in those chairs as uh, country assistants, development team assistants, uh, project supervisors, and these projects were, you know. $500 million and above, uh, how could a 35 year old who had uh, completed a PhD just three or four years earlier decide on behalf of an entire country, even if it was a small country like Laos or Cambodia, uh, that this is what was needed? I couldn't make any sense of it. <clears throat> I expected others to, but I didn't find enough. Perhaps I didn't look, of course, I was saying, you know, we get wrapped up into so many things, we, we can't look everywhere at the same time. But that's, there certainly didn't seem to be enough evidence that there was a critical eye being cast on any of this. Uh, I would say the principle of it is, what does, what does any multilateral institution follow as a reference point for any action that it undertakes? When we wanted what we called uh, a ground report from any place where we didn't have a correspondent or a reporter, then we would look for, and we usually had on hand, and especially if uh, you're at an assistant editor level and above, then you would have on hand a list of what we called stringers. So a stringer is somebody who usually uh, would uh, work in um, one of the language newspapers, so a, a non-English language newspaper, but who was uh, whose writing in English was competent enough or uh, clear enough so that with minor ed- editing it could become a news story. So we valued stringers, as editors we valued stringers because they were the man on the spot. Uh, I could, you know, convince my f- finance chap to, uh, to put some money into sending somebody to that place uh, so that we would have our city reporter, our city correspondent go there uh, and report on what was happening. But the man on the spot knew what was going on on a day-to-day basis. And so what he wrote uh, would have far more weight, far more gravitas. The UN agencies do not, as a rule, uh, have stringers uh, because stringers would be inconvenient. What I'd like to get back to is is where I was at uh, about five to six years ago, as I said, this red signal of the young people. And then uh, one, I think, something happened which uh, in two or three, uh, during two or three uh, occasions, when I met uh, friends in, uh, it was in Bombay, Bangalore, and I think here in Delhi. And these are people who were teaching. The, the second one who I had met, uh, this was in Bombay. Uh, he was teaching at one of these uh, management uh, institutes. And uh, I went and picked him up. We were going to go out for uh, a drink and dinner. And uh, this, uh, the the college was in ferment. There were young people running around, uh, banners and posters, and all sorts of things were going on up on the walls and. Uh, uh, a hall was being readied and uh, he just mentioned that, look, there's a lot uh, going on right now because we're having a mock UN uh, uh, assembly. Uh, so this was the first time I'd heard of it and I said, what, what on earth is a mock UN assembly? And so he explained to me that, uh, look, this is what happens or these uh, students, uh, each of them then gets to represent one country and then they take up uh, resolutions that have been passed and then they discuss them and uh, they each takes one side and each takes another side and then and so on and so forth. And uh, this was repeated to me uh, when I asked uh, uh, my other friends who were teaching in Bangalore and Delhi who mentioned this. 
I said, is this thing what you call this mock UN assembly? They said, yes. And you have it in your college or your university? Yes. And then one, one day in Bangalore, when uh, I was uh, setting off for one of my, what we call uh, missions, I, it was somewhere to, uh, you know, either to Sri Lanka or to Cambodia. Uh, what I usually had to do was to print out, like I do here, but much more voluminous, uh, some of the material that I have to present and, and, and so on. Bangalore has this thing called a printo, uh, which is a print shop. And there was one just on Brigade Road, which I used to go to often. And these fellows were completely occupied, totally busy, printing out uh, something that immediately caused, caught my eye, because I saw these cards coming out of that printing machine saying, Sierra Leone, uh, Bolivia, uh, Central African Republic, uh, Dominican Republic, etc. What on earth is this? And then somebody told me uh, it's one of those um, schools um, which is around central Bangalore, which is having a UN uh, mock UN session. And I realized that this had got into the schools as well. So joining the dots, I saw that in fact what was happening was uh, part of a very concerted, certainly a very concerted push to advance the UN mode of thinking about the way societies should be governed everywhere it could reach provided there was literacy enough to grasp the simplest ideas in which it was couched. And this I thought uh, was very dangerous because uh, for, for the first obvious reason that uh, it immediately introduced as you said the, the perceived prestige of the UN system at a very early age. I couldn't see any difference. In fact, if it was done at uh, to students in the ninth or 10th standards of a school, and if it was done to students who were, um, let's say, in the third year of their bachelors, there's not much of an age difference really from, from my point of view in terms of uh, how much experience and exposure and understanding you have gained between the lower stage and the latter stage. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, this seemed to, not seem to, it certainly was happening without any obvious questioning or intervention or dilution of any kind. Um, so the this next obvious question was, who was providing this as a system of indoctrination? And why was it not being uh, questioned? With the schools themselves were providing it, but who was providing the schools or the colleges? I couldn't get that far. It, it remained uh, uh, unsolved uh, as far as I was concerned. I'm sure you have better answers. But the, the mere fact that this was still prevalent and is, is c probably continues to be prevalent now, I think is uh, uh, a red flag of an even redder degree than what I saw in 2015 or 16. Uh, because it would mean that we have allowed things to merely float as they are uh, for the intervening years. And uh, now with the push, the, the very concerted push towards Agenda 2030, that is going to become uh, even more difficult to, to um, counter. What I neglected to do was to ask you, which I which I noted down here, is uh, but which I've already gathered a bit of. What are your thoughts about what we call the multilateral system? Uh, what do you think is the system other than the UN, and uh, how do both of these work? And whether you have any in, in examples either directly in your careers or in your uh, pursuits of any interests, or whether you have. Uh, been man, um, maneuvered either by your conscience or by the conscience of your elders to begin to question it and uh, therefore sort out the right kind of uh, um, literature or perhaps audiovisual to read or listen to. So this is something I wanted to ask uh, the participants before we actually set off. I think this just does point to, you know, that uh, perhaps one is you know, one is certainly predestined to see things 
at some point in your life uh, when and having seen them then you look around and you wonder why why isn't he seeing it why isn't she seeing it why can't i talk about it with so and so and so on and and and, and that sort of thing and this becomes i think a uh, a important if not one of the most important intellectual turning points and if i do feel very strongly that if you don't go through these intellectual turning points you will not be equipped to recognize or then participate in your spiritual turning point uh, because if you cannot really or if you turn away from the truths that your own chitta and buddhi are telling you then what are you going to do when paramatma is giving you so many symbols and signs and signals every single day and this is really a part of you know what you were saying about uh, this urban space that we are being forced to live in uh, all our signs and symbols are in spaces like this which is why my wife and i decided to go to goa a long time ago you get signals and signs and symbols and uh, every single day and uh, this is part of i feel the uh, planetary ghettoization of humans uh, which uh, has in divorced you from the very energetics that give us our being uh, and put yourself into these uh, these uh, gilded cages full of toys and trinkets uh, except that toys and trinkets have a lot of user manuals attached to them and those user manuals are written by the multilateral system these plants don't produce seeds and in cross pollination it would destroy the natural plant varieties so i don't know what what the un is doing why isn't it stopping that in fact it is being promoted and even the present uh, prime minister is uh, planning to implement uh, bt i think mustard we already have bt cotton now mustard to into the fruit food sector i think it's uh, it's it's not uh, youngsters who are passionate about uh, the other side of the uh, the ideology like uh, you know people saying good people stuck in hard jobs uh, it is it is it is exactly that it is people who are lured with uh, the prestige and the money part of it they are not people who are passionate they are hungry for validation they are youngsters who are hungry for validation mm. uh, and and it's very easy to overturn them to this side is this side also become as heavily funded as un and many of its undertakings are so any one was my first exposure second was um, since my dad's in the army he went to um, africa he went to kenya to the through the un mission uh, and he talks about i mean some of the anecdotes so he was a blue helmet yes yeah, sorry so he was a blue helmet yes yeah. yes uh uh uh-huh. he he i mean some of the anecdotes he shares are unmentionable here but uh, he talks about uh, you know the uh, i think we have, i was talking to dr edst and uh, i i said that uh, today we're talking about multilateralism and how you know we are looked down upon as a brown country but i think uh, what uh, he talked to me about was that racism has come to an end which is quite true what i mean is maybe we are not looked at as a brown country we are looked at as a pagan country i think that is the way that we are viewed as and that is something that my dad felt very much uh, being there in un when you know he saw these africans very easily you know absorb french as their medium of uh, expression or whether they saw these uh, international correspondents and representatives how they are easily able to control uh, people there and the tensions over there and how easily you know uh, india and and pakistan and these countries were supposed to be the infantry for these tensions so i mean if someone dies it's our people uh, but then congratulations to the denmark army because well you were there to you know say hi to all of us and wave because everyone else so he talks about that uh, i think both of these things uh, quite resoundingly made made very made it very clear to me that uh, this is a new model of colonization this is uh, this is a new way to uh, keep us down and this is a new way to monetize 
on uh, on human behavior which is natural to uh, countries like ours like i said validation money prestige these are very important to eastern cultures and this is what they monetize on like they have monetized on the existing divides that have been in the countries whether it be the hindu muslim divide whether it be the proxy wars that were fought during the cold war they have always monetized uh, uh, on these particular divides and that is what they are doing through un as well this is uh, very much uh... you know what you were saying about the the christianization of the brown races here yeah. uh, you look at uh, the um, the italian uh, missionaries for example roberto de nobili who spent uh, probably 3 to 4 years learning tamil yeah. uh and be- because of his approach then the vatican invented this term or either appropriated from from somewhere called acculturation uh where and it could be applied only in the missionary context where the missionary or group of missionaries would in fact uh just imbibe what there was in order for their mission to succeed but their mission would commence only after they had achieved some um familiarity familiarity and facility with language and customs and dress and everything else and food of course I'll, I'll tell you about china from inside uh and uh part of you know what you're saying about how has china managed to do this but then you talked about it he was high due to capacity and by due time but he did it no, i mean he, he, they made they have made they have said it uh, in in these ways but uh, what i saw directly uh, has uh, i think they are the masters of illusion masters and uh, i saw this time and time and again in that time mentioned about the the way the chinese had maneuvered themselves into who uh in fact from uh there was this woman who was the head of who for two terms uh margaret chan uh and i think many people who were even even um moderately critical of who didn't see it at that time what that meant uh and then there's the situation of uh, the un today uh with uh, or vis-a-vis not vis-a-vis but certainly with the old chinese incursion into the multilaterals and that's something that i think uh, i don't think our academics or our uh, uh, what do we call them geo strategists have been able to really get a grip on you know uh some years ago um well just to backtrack a bit so what did happen is that when china decided that culture was they understood culture as being a very powerful vector for advancing their interests uh they told um, unesco that we'll set up one of your centers which will help your conventions your cultural conventions we'll do it in beijing so they did and they put up the money for it and so on uh and this was supposed to help um achieve the aims of these cultural conventions you know in the entire asian region there are similar centers in japan and in south korea uh and i served as uh one of the advisory council members on for the center for two terms which meant uh frequent visits uh not only to beijing but then also to other cities uh in in china all the big ones they only big ones there uh and uh when they do of course they will invite hundreds of people from uh asia and even though this was about asia they would invite people large contingents from africa the african countries in which they had all these interests so all this was going on uh the unesco officials and in fact uh, other officials who came from uh um the other major agencies uh, who were interested in the cultural approach unicef uh, undp they didn't seem to mind at all they look what's going on there uh how is it that you know we have a a uh, meeting about a particular convention and then the agenda gets enlarged to what development cooperation china is doing in africa what's going on 
nobody seemed to care, nobody seemed to mind because they were all on a holiday or they were all having, uh, uh, you know, banquets and so on. Uh, but this uh, also included um, a lot of pomp and pageantry, parades, uh, you know, dances by folk troops and all the rest of that, which are spectacular to look at because China does that very well. Uh, and at some point, I'll tell you in detail about uh, one particular uh, visit that I had made because I was conducting a, anyway, but I'll tell you about that uh, either t probably tomorrow because that was truly, truly an eye-opener as to the lengths that this country will go to in order to show the world something because China understands very well the power and reach of the UN uh, public relations and media system. It understands it very well, perhaps better than better than the, the Anglo mind does. And they use it, they use it uh, without any compunction. They use it to, to push anything through. Uh, by 1914, around 8,000 treaties were in force, covering topics from border delimitation to trade. Most of these treaties were bilateral, though the 19th century witnessed the new phenomenon of multilateralism, notably in the founding documents of the first international organizations recognized them as such. The interwar period increased treaty making activity with the League of Nations registering almost 5,000 treaties, most of them bilateral, while also spearheading the adoption of several multilateral conventions. Since the adoption of the UN Charter, more than 70,000 treaties have been registered with the UN. Since the adoption of the UN Charter, sorry, Secretariat, and treaty making activity continues at an unrelenting pace with an average of 250 treaties and treaty actions, ratifications, accessions, withdrawals registered every month. Multilateral conventions now cover topics ranging from human rights to drugs and crime, from trade and development to the governance of outer space. Many, though certainly not all, of these treaties were adopted under the auspices of the UN. A rich literature analyzes the various treaties, but a study on the auspices themselves, the contribution of the UN as a forum and as an institution has lacked. What is missing is a detailed examination of how the UN itself has contributed, though its multilateral treaty making activity to the development of international law. This introduction briefly surveys how that role has evolved from serving primarily as the place at which treaties are negotiated to being one of the vehicles for implementing that which has been agreed. In doing so, the UN has reflected and contributed to a larger transformation as international law moved from bilateralism to multilateralism. The UN is more than a place in which treaties are negotiated and an actor that takes place in their implementation. However, its existence and its role are part of a larger transformation in the structure of international law more generally. International law in the first half of the 20th century relied heavily upon bilateral contractual agreements between states, the international community, such as it was, acted through states that enjoyed a monopoly over legal status at the international level. The term United States Nations was first used in a declaration signed by 26 of the Allied States in January 1942. A year later, as the tide of war was turning, US President Franklin Roosevelt observed in his 1943 New Year's Day message that the United Nations are passing from the defensive to the offensive. By the time the UN Charter was signed in San Francisco on June 26, 1945, the plural had been replaced by the singular. It became common to refer not to what the United Nations as a group of states were doing, but what the United Nations as an institution was doing. In this way, an alliance against common force became an organization with common goals. The achievement of those goals was explicitly tied to the possibility of multilateral treaty making. The Charter repeatedly stressed the importance of international law and mandated the General Assembly to encourage its progressive development and codification. From the outset, the Assembly from the outset, the Assembly to encourage its progress uh, the Assembly approached this function with the broadest possible interpretation, including but not limited to the roles played by the International Law Commission, the Sixth Committee and the UN Commission on International Trade Law. In addition, by, by establishing itself as the presumptive depository 
of treaties, the UN further promoted the conclusion and publication of international agreements. Thank you. Uh, now, I chose this uh, passage from, I think, one of these, uh, one of the references which I have cited elsewhere in the, the notes, it hasn't appeared here, uh, because I thought it goes well with giving us a background of what is this, uh, the primary apparatus uh, and why does it work the main trust. So, as you can see from here, uh, treaties, 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 and therefore law, 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 and therefore rather the primacy of contractual obligations between states, that is nation states, that is countries, and a UN agency. So, you know, if you if you if you shear away, if you cut away all this jargon, uh, to me what is left is that here is an organization which has emerged from you know, this whole thing called which, uh, this whole thing which emerged, uh, which uh, uh, took shape in the, in the from the middle section of the Second World War and then took uh, greater form and substance uh, following that, which has been uh, adept at, uh, as we were saying in the earlier session, extending the the um, binding um, mechanisms of the colonial state and <clears throat> this is what it has to be seen as uh, seen as because of the examples that I will show you which has interfered directly which all have interfered directly with the endogenous thinking and thought process concerning any of the subjects with which the UN has concerned itself with and with which uh, the UN has exercised its authority over as the supranational entity, so any agency. So, if we say, let's look for the, the sort of uh, draft and shape that environmental law must uh, take in our country on such and such topic, then we have to look at the UN repository is there so. With health, we do the same thing with uh, water and uh, let's say inter-basin river management, we do the same thing. With uh, <clears throat> forests and mangroves, we do the same thing, wetlands and so on. Why are we doing this? We are doing this because the what we are saying here is that is that we have had now 55, 75 years of the relentless sophistication of binding mechanisms which are growing ever more complex <coughs> and ever more labyrinthine that enmeshes our countries, all of which, uh, many of which are now signatories to practically uh, 90 to, I don't know, one estimate I was, uh, I came across was 90 to 91 percent of the conventions, treaties, and uh, uh, so-called multilateral instruments uh, that exist. So, uh, if you look at it from that point of view, <coughs> here we have this, the UN plus its affiliate ML organizations, uh, plus their affiliate uh, uh, INGOs, NGOs and so on. We have a massive, uh, massive structure in place in the world whose primary uh, weapon is in fact the creation of these uh, bindings. Uh, how that enmesh enmeshes nation states and how that particularly enmeshes the nation state administrations is something that uh, I will uh, tackle and you will have to tackle that uh, later <coughs> session. But when when I mean to, to say that we need to understand that the apparatus of any agency uh, has been created for its work, this is the primary work. So, to give you an example, if <clears throat> the UNDP has programs, those programs, although they are not conventions and treaties, those programs are given the same sort of resource resources by the agency as any convention and any, as any treaty would be.
with UNESCO, it's a much more simple matter. There are all the con cultural conventions. Each has its own secretariat. In the same way, each UNDP program has its own secretariat. Each FAO program has its own sec secretariat. FAO does have treaties and uh, uh, agreements. For example, the uh, uh, Treaty on Plant Genetic uh, uh, Material. So those are become, let us say, individual the individual departments in the supranational ministry because it has to be treated as such. And those are mammoth departments. Mammoth not in terms of uh, the, the number of people, but in terms of the reach. Uh, and what is the reach? The reach is to every single country and territory which has ratified uh, these or acceded to these. So there, there are all these uh, uh, terminologies that I had to become familiar with. I had no idea what at all what they meant. Uh, what is the difference between ratification and accession? Well, it's, it's, uh, it has to do with this and it has to do with that. And uh, this was uh, um, when I began to do this work on FAO, especially in the area of uh, uh, the agricultural heritage sites. Every single treaty, convention or multi-year program which has a dedicated secretariat for itself also has a dedicated pool of, of staff. This pool of staff is paid from what is called the, uh, the usual budgetary provision of the UN agency. The usual budgetary provision is uh, of a UN agency is supplied by its member states. So there is a recommended minimum which uh, I think generally each member state does try to follow. Uh, many of them are of course in, in uh, in uh, permanent areas on one or the other or several at a time um, and uh, that is the reason why technically the UN agencies like to say that they are always in a shortfall uh, in terms of their members contributions. Members mean their country contributions. So they may be technically correct but this is only as far as the work budget is concerned. Then there is what we would immediately recognize as uh, extra budgetary streams of uh, income or if we put it that way I think which is more apt to call it revenue <laughs> revenue for the UN agencies uh, and this really comes from the uh, the much more I think important uh, connections that uh, exist between the upper echelons of UN agencies uh, and uh, the diplomatic core uh, of uh, countries. So what that does is that creates uh, programs which are meant to support a UN agency in its work through one of its treaties or one of its instruments but which exists outside the usual budgetary framework. What this does then is that this immediately enlarges the money space for any agency. But the enlargement then becomes outside supervision. That means outside supervisable boundaries. What is supervisable is the work budget and that is supervised at the annual, usually the annual uh, committee meeting or the annual assembly meeting for that particular agency or if the program is large enough or if the treaty is important enough, that particular assembly. Uh, and uh, that is so far as the members' contributions over which technically the members have a right to uh, intervene and question and demand uh, uh, budget sheets and balance sheets and audits and so on. But what happens with the rest is that goes under <coughs> extra budgetary contributions, special contributions, there are all sorts of uh, uh, fabulous names that are given to them. For example, I mean, I used to uh, for, for some of my missions in, in Asia, I used to be paid out of something called the Japan hyphen funds hyphen in hyphen trust, <laughs> which was very simply a large lump of money that the government of Japan threw at UNESCO and said, uh, please use it uh, uh, in ways that you like to use it. But when you use it, make sure that you, it is used in countries where we have a sizable diplomatic presence and in which we have also done work 
through our own aid agency and that happened to be JICA, the Japan, Japan International Cooperation Agreement, I think it is. So all this came with strings attached, uh, silken strings but strings nonetheless. Uh, and the reason they did that is because, and, and of course I am singling out Japan because I think on maybe four, I think four of these uh, missions that uh, probably two, uh, all of them were in Southeast Asia. Uh, I got paid as a, a an, as an expert on intangible cultural heritage, not by UNESCO directly, not by UNESCO headquarters or by UNESCO Bangkok, but because of uh, because through because of money from the Japan Funds and Trust. So what I'm trying to show you by this is that in this Japan in this case uh, through the Funds and Trust for this particular agency, it would have Funds and Trust for other agencies which do which engage people like me uh, in other sectors, in other countries. What then happens is that this becomes effectively a hidden arrangement. The secretariat of a convention or a treaty will report it at the annual meeting, but it's a report. It's not a statement of objectives at the start of a program year or at the start of a program cycle, which in the UN system is two years. This, so a, a, a secretarial administrator does not go up and say that, look, uh, we are expecting this money to come from such and such country. We are going to call it this and we ex expect we would like to deploy this money in so and so country to work on convention A or B or C or treaty A or B or C. No, what they will do instead is they will uh, first, I think uh, uh, this is something that uh, I have I have pondered over long enough because very often I came across uh, situations in, in these countries which simply didn't make sense to me and what didn't make sense to me is the presence of certain people who had nothing to do with what we were doing uh, from the countries that were actually donating that money. Why is this Japanese man who builds uh, railway lines, why is he sitting here? That fellow there from this uh, that new multilateral development bank that's set up in Shanghai, who are busy actually uh, giving money for uh, garment processing factories, what's he doing here? You do things like that, electrical power transmission and so on. Uh, and uh, these were obviously signs to the uh, backroom operations or the backroom deals that existed between UN agencies and uh, what uh, UN agencies love to call donor countries. Uh, of course, the donations are all are all given the cloak and the garb of uh, humanitarian assistance or relief, or uh, where uh, the 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 donor agency, you know, as I said, uh, then becomes the 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 hidden director of where the money is to be deployed. Uh, by where I mean not for a particular program, they are not interested in the program. They are interested in the effect that the use of the money for that program has on their continuing presence in that country as a vector of a particular kind of development that they are interested in seeing happen in that country. You would have your head chopped off if you said that. Uh, in a uh, UN agency, of course they have accountability, but they, as it, it happens to be post facto, you've already done it. So they will report it. And having reported it, then the, at the, what the usual pattern is, it will get reported at the, at the annual session of the agency or the convention or the treaty or the program or the international instrument. And then it will be up to, it will be put up to the member states to agree that this becomes part of the official record and then that it, uh, the conclusions or the recommendations arising from that particular program will themselves be used as, as a justification for something to, to follow in the coming year. But this is the extent of it. When it falls into the extra budgetary, uh, um, streams of income. So, I mean, you know, the corollary question is what happens to the money that uh, the member states, the, that is the countries, 
that are signatories or that are, that are members of any uh, convention agreement treaty uh, which they are obligated to pay every year, what happens to that? A lot of that goes into just running this whole apparatus, paying for people, uh, paying for people and their, uh, uh, I mean, one would have to say extravagant salaries and even more extravagant lifestyles. Um, can you guess how much the, uh, since, you know, UNESCO is the agency which uh, crops up in my speech the most often, country director in, in India, uh, what the annual uh, salary is? From what I was, uh, I remember being told about, uh, uh, what, four years ago, it was about just under 200,000. But, 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 but then again, this is just salary. Yeah, this is only salary and, 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 uh, you know, if, if the UN, the country director of a UN agency was like a Gulf NRI, he would save 100% of it. Because he spends on nothing else, accommodation, transport, holidays, all the rest of it uh, is, is paid for. During the time that I was very active with the Narmada Bachao Andolan, yeah. And when we had uh, this fellow, uh, this World Bank head, uh, Wolfenson, James Wolfenson, uh, and uh, um, there were, during that period, there were a lot of protests. I mean, there were protests anyway, all over the place during NBA days. But when Wolfenson was there, uh, thanks to uh, this organization at that time, which was called uh, International Rivers, there was a chap called uh, Patrick McCurry, who then wrote a book about uh, um, the whole big dams uh, nonsense. Uh, the word that or the info that we got out of uh, those activists was that was that the World Bank gobbled up something like nearly seventy percent of their budget on themselves. Uh, their annual budget was to sustain themselves, and this was. You, it was unimaginable to us that you you are supposed to be the international bank for reconstruction and development, uh, which is your official title. What reconstruction and development can do can you do with three out of ten dollars? Uh, so um, anyway, but I suppose uh, the UN agencies have have uh, brazenly internalized this whole contradiction and uh, gone about their work uh, thereafter. And not only that, they have actually enlarged it because what does happen, in fact, your, your point about accountability, uh, what is told even to the representatives of the member states is what is spent from a particular uh, source and tranche of funds from that source, not what is collected or not what is agreed upon and is yet to be collected. So we don't know what whatsoever. So they may talk about a additional budget or an extra work budget, etc., from which certain activities are funded. But the corpus of that budget we don't know, because there'll be multiple agreements with multiple donors, usually the larger uh, OECD countries, all of whom have uh, major aid programs uh, and aid agencies of their own, and all of whom will then expect these uh, country operations under that particular UN agency to coincide with, to align with and so on. So uh, this is uh, uh, this is an inside view of uh, the 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 whole money uh, uh, kind of a carousel that goes on with uh, the UN agencies and the uh, larger powers. WHO uh, which has an outsized budget, who audits WHO? Do you know that the uh, CAG, our CAG, audits WHO accounts. So CAG's counterparts in other countries, which have a certain level of uh, expertise and, and uh, technical competence who can do this, they do this for other UN agencies as well. So far as I know, CAG has audited WHO for two cycles and on both, they have raised major issues. Where did this money come from? You said you would spend it here, you didn't spend it here and, and so on and so on. Massive issues. If you look at them as in, and if you go to WHO, anybody, UNFPA, whoever it is, and say, please describe to us the ways in which you have self-corrective, self-remedial measures and uh, internal processes, they'll say, yes, 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 of course, we have this, that, and the other. Like I was telling you about the 
uh, the invisible UN uh, units which do the internal oversight. So that there are two parts to that. One is program oversight and one is financial oversight. So they do have that, but it's not public. Even even the internal oversight that I have uh, surveys uh, that I have contributed to are not public. So they and 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 this is the this is the you know there are it's like it's like one of those halls of mirrors. There are levels of veils that you don't even know exist. So member states often don't know that a internal oversight report has been uh, produced until they ask for it. So it's not a private corporation, uh, nor is the auditing firm a private corporation. So I wish there was a, at some point I was, had been able to uh, gain entry into one of these uh, general assemblies, but being a mundane and lowly uh, uh, sort of uh, oriental figure in some backwater third world place, I never made uh, the grade. But uh, thanks to some higher ups, I did get some idea of how it actually works and really what I heard, uh, at first it completely confused me but then when I sat and, and thought about it and, and thought about what I had experienced and who I had seen in those countries doing what, then it began to sort of make sense in a, in a peculiar way. You know, if you are part of one of these things, you bang your head on the wall in frustration and say, look, uh, you know, uh, we have been in situations, by, by we I mean, the name given to my technical role in the on working on heritage, cultural heritage was expert facilitator in the Asian region. Uh, so at that time there were what about twelve others, uh, and often I would, you know, usually two of us would be in some country at, at, uh, for for a particular program, and we would bang our heads on the wall in frustration because. Somebody from a district could not come to the capital, the district capital even, uh, to attend what we were doing there because they had no money. And uh, um, part of the preparation for a UN agency mission is that you begin working with your host organization, which is uh, the, um, the ministry or the department in the country, in the national administration which is mandated to liaise with that UN agency. So you begin working with them usually three to three and a half months before the date of your arrival. So you, you, um, you first get to know who it is you're going to work with. You have a couple of phone calls with them. Uh, you start exchanging emails. You provide a draft program. Um, again, it's you, the UN agency, providing the draft program to them the receiver of wisdom, the receiver of UN wisdom. And this is what I, why I pointed out about the reciprocity, it's never that way. Uh, then you tweak the program, you want it, they, they want it for longer. UN agencies always want long programs, four, five, six, seven days. And uh, having my experience with uh, rural development, when we used to work even with the uh, Center for Environment Education uh, Himalaya, uh, or uh, with the ICR program, you can't get people in rural areas to sit down for more than two, two and a half days. Even for us in three days, I still have that, you know, that anxiety. How am I going to uh, justify your sitting around here for three days uh, when you have other things to do? Uh, and for, especially for people in rural areas, they're certainly not going to, to sit around for two, two and a half uh, days uh, waiting for wisdom to fall from the UN skies uh, and be enlightened. Um, so they are going to say, no, 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 five days is far too much, we want three days. And so that negotiation will go on, eventually you settle on something. <coughs> then you tailor the program accordingly. Um, and then you get to the point where you want to know who are the participants, where are they coming from, uh, what work do they do, what interest do they have in this, and what do you need to get those participants here. And uh, when I mean, invariably, the the uh, minist the ministry of uh, and administration officials would say that look, we'd like these many people to come, but we are probably going to fall short of money. Uh, in which case, my email would go to a uh, the representative of that agency or that convention or treaty on the ground there in whichever country it was saying, look, 
could you release a little bit of money so this poor fellow can at least hop into a bus and come to wherever we are going to have this meeting? And there was never any answer because they couldn't do it or they wouldn't do it. Uh, and this is the thing that used to, I think is is really symptomatic of the way the a UN agency treats those who it makes a point of saying it is there to help. This was absurd. I mean, these I have been in absolutely point, point blank, outright absurd situations. It's beyond comic. I mean, uh, we were in Sri Lanka in Kandy, uh, and uh, I was running a program there together with uh, a, another facilitator. And on the final day, on the final day, there was no attention given by anybody whatsoever. But uh, there was a, a lot of confusion, a lot of arguing, etc. And what happened was that they had run out of money uh, to pay for the bus to go back from Kandy to Colombo and then the participants would dis dis disperse from Colombo on their own. But the bus from Kandy to Colombo, they didn't have money to pay for anymore. Uh, and uh, of course, the participants being, you know, from, uh, um, I mean, less, very much less than middle class uh, homes, uh, was saying, look, you told us that you would uh, pay for it. We can't pay for it on our own. Why should we? And so on and so forth. So what we did is we said, look, just tell us how much the bus costs. We'll pay for it. That is me and my co-facilitator. And uh, eventually that's what we had to do just to get them back to Colombo. Uh, so, of course, it was great loss of face for the Sri Lankan national authorities. At that time, it was the... Uh, the National Archives in Colombo and the uh, Department of Education. It was split between both these, the, the cultural sector. But uh, for for the participants, they would have been stuck there and uh, left to their own devices to get to get home to wherever it was, Northern Province, Southern Province, anywhere, Trincomalee, wherever it was. You neither recognize them, nor do you understand, and this is something that used to irk me every single time, nor do you understand their mode of living. You do not know what they have to face from season to season, how they organize their household income, within their difficult circumstances, how they conduct their craft or their art. And therefore, even the most elementary socio-economic profiling that look, let us understand where you make your money from, out of this, how much comes from your art, whether you are selling it or whether you are teaching it or your craft, the same thing, uh, and then see how we can help you. None of that would happen. So, if I would insist on the on the uh, host ministry or the host administration providing that, then uh, it would be rooted back to to UNESCO saying the, the uh, regional center, which, for example, for Sri Lanka, the regional uh, center for UNESCO would be here in Delhi. Uh, this is being asked for. Can you please provide uh, data, which you know again signals uh, a, a total gap. Um, in the uh, national administration side because they don't have any because they haven't been told that this is going to be required i've been to uh, to 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 them in in for example in central and eastern europe in uh, uh, two of the countries there uh, only in order to uh, to talk about certain aspects of our work in asia but they did seem to i mean those are also quite poor countries they did seem to have uh, some way of, of dealing with it, which is better than how we deal with it. Uh, part of the reading of life, which the UN agencies consistently and religiously fail to do, uh, because, I mean, I have to come to that conclusion, given all the evidence that I have accumulated, that is what they are designed to do. They are not designed to solve these uh, great problems which they have drafted and which they have crafted. They're not designed to do that. They're designed to do very much uh, the other kind of thing, which you know we've got our notes down on this: the the propagation of the neo-colonial project. And this has to do with a lot of the UN agencies that have anything to do at all with environment, nature, water, rivers, forests, and so on, because all of them touch this part of uh, indigeneity. And uh, this, to me, is us. I mean, it's. You know, it's danger on the scale beyond beyond the graph, out of the charts. Because uh, this is in fact a mode of uh, mind control about the self, 
uh, that has already taken root and you know in the morning I was telling you that at some point about uh, six years ago I began to see what I call these danger signals, the red lights, the lal battis are flashing. Uh, look, this is something that needs to be addressed, uh, needs to be thought about carefully in a sustained manner. And this certainly was one of them because I found myself uh, uh, going from one mission to another. Uh, when I look back at it, essentially coaching people how to describe what they do in language that is not theirs. Using, using thought frames and thought modes that can never be theirs. But which have to be, have to be provided to their own uh, uh, state administration so that their state administration fulfills its country's ob uh, obligations to that UN agency. Just to uh, give it a 180 degree twist, um, I'll tell you about it from the other side. By, from the other side, I mean from the side where people, the local people, let's say, I'm saying local people with, uh, you know, with just reference to whoever happens to be living in a place where there's some kind of problem and, and they're doing something about it themselves. Uh, when, uh, you know, the IPCC has been running this now for about, uh, I think, 12 years or so. Uh, probably, yeah, certainly more than a decade, but about 12 years. What they have is something which is called uh, some kind of database of uh, indigenous knowledge or traditional knowledge that has to do with tackling or living, tackling climate change. Um, so they have a complete section of it uh, on their website, and in fact, a section of it in their secretariat and all that. And what they do is that they ask uh, other UN agencies, look, uh, you chaps are working on uh, either on tribal people or you're working on forests or you're working on agriculture or you're working on water systems, whatever it is you're working on, you know, uh, mountain water basins, dry land and so on. If you find interesting people doing things that we'd like to hear about, just send us uh, some text and some photographs and if you have a video that would be lovely. And then they put all this together and they give each a label and they have these uh, nice looking, exciting looking maps with all these uh, square uh, circles and dots and all on them saying that look, we've got the world covered in terms of uh, having uh, mapped solutions from the ground to tackle climate change. So. Then the solutions from the ground to tackle climate change becomes in effect a PR slogan and a campaign for the IPCC's work to justify the IPCC's work and the successes of its uh, conferences of parties, huh? which has entered its 26th year by the way. Let me present both sides uh, and uh, therefore cover all, all the possibilities of uh, narration and counter narration because by presenting the side of the solutions from the ground about climate change, we've, we've mapped them, we have understand how it works. That's why uh, we have programs to support the indigenous and the, the uh, uh, local activities, wherever it is, through our partner agencies. They also, on the other side, at the negotiating side, that is not only during the COPs, but in the uh, three or four other major meetings that they have on climate change negotiations through the year, that's where they also give sanction to things like geoengineering. That means the technical fixes which require huge funnels of money coming in to be able to do this because that's what the, 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 the whole technical fix uh, depends on. Uh, so on the one hand, they have this, uh, let's look at the local and let's celebrate the local. And on the other hand, they have this which, which emanates directly from this global view, you know. Ours is a 30,000 mile in the, in the stratosphere view of the planet as a whole, this blue ball spinning in space and we know exactly how to fix it. You know, so it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's completely delusional. I have to say that uh, my political science awareness is uh, as close to nil as I am comfortable being with. Uh, but where uh, this thing about committees and experts, you know, and of course, I'm counted as one of those UNESCO experts. 
the UNESCO World Heritage Convention, which is one of the best known conventions in the world, uh, and of which we have, I don't know how many, are, I think we have 22 or 23 so called, uh, as they call it, elements listed on that thing. Um, do you know how many experts and consultants they have on their roles on their roster? I don't know whether they're active or not. Anything is too few, but do you know how many? Last I heard uh, from, this was from a gentleman in, uh, again in Sri Lanka, he was uh, part of uh, the World Heritage Committee for some time, 26,000 all around the world. What do these fellows do? So that's as far as uh, one UNESCO convention is concerned. Uh, the FAO uh, Global Consultation on Food Security and Nutrition which I was a part of during my five years with, uh, not five, but about four, four of the years with uh, um, the Ministry of Agriculture ICR program. And then because I continued to uh, work with the, uh, with that uh, in, a, in a quite a critical way, for, for some reason uh, I was kept on and I'm still technically part of it. This is the, the group of people who are supposed to uh, provide advice to the one of the apex uh, FAO committees is called the Committee on Food Security, um, which I think for two terms was chaired by M. S. Swaminathan, who people may have. I hope they do have mixed views about. Um, I don't have mixed views about him um, or his daughter. Um, that when it began. It had uh, about uh, 11 or 1200 people. Today, do you know how many they have? 25,000 and counting. They're growing at the, at the, the, at the and the, the fastest uh, growing region for gathering people uh, into that is uh, Africa, the uh, African region. And uh, to my surprise, it was a surprise it was to me about 12, 13 years ago because I thought that the um, natural in inclination of the African uh, experts would be that, you know, yes, we, we hear you FAO, but leave us alone kind of thing. Uh, on the contrary, it was completely the opposite. Uh, they, they avidly cheered uh, what the FAO staffers and, and scientists would propose. They said, whatever you, if they said almost in so many words, whatever you do, do it here first. Um, so, you know, I think at some point we were talking about the use of, of not only of language but of ideas, uh, of borrowed language and borrowed ideas. And this was, uh, 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 I think, to, to me one of the most glaring examples, one of the most uh, disappointing but obvious examples of that happening in, you know, in the very recent past. Ikrisat, which is uh, close to you, yeah, Patancheru. Uh, ICRISAT has been, you know, this ICRISAT is part of the CGIIR. I mean, we're going a little bit uh, away from, well, no, 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 we're, it's, we're still multilateral, no yeah. problem. Yeah, we're still multilateral, <laughs> uh, which is uh, part of the CGIIR. So they are the ones who, uh, because of the dry land agriculture, so they have been exporting their know-how of uh, essentially of uh, genetic uh, modification to, to the East African zone now for, uh, I mean, they were doing it already when I got into that uh, agreement program in 2009. So they were already doing it from around the mid 2000s. Uh, and in fact, there was regular traffic between uh, Ikrisat and uh, Kenya. And then from Kenya, they would disperse. So, which seeds are you looking at? Legumes. Yeah, legumes, but also uh, then they moved to. Um, uh, cassava, mm -hmm. cassava, yam, taro, all that. Uh, then they moved into uh, sorghum. Sorghum is hugely important there. Uh, they they also brew beer out of sorghum. Uh, and uh, what else? Yeah, and then uh, the the, the uh, uh, small ruminants, large ruminants. Um, so they moved all the, the so that traffic began a long time ago and uh, 
those were also the formative years of uh, the uh, uh, what is it called AGRA uh, which is the uh, Gates Foundation funded uh, program in, in Africa. So all this happened you know in parallel which is why at that time I expected that look having had the experience of, of uh, correspondence with the South Africans, the AC bio, those who are against the genetic uh, modification of uh, crops and plants and seeds in South Africa, I had the uh, expectation that uh, their actions and their methods would have in fact permeated the countries to the north of it. But uh, whether it did or not, I don't know. I certainly didn't see any evidence of it in those consultations uh, to that FAO committee. Yeah, so uh, I think that gives us a good footing to move on to the next topic which I had slated for today afternoon session which is uh, this, this thing called global governance.